Okay, um, we're going to talk about the kinetic molecular theory, movement of gas particles, and their speed, and that, that sort of stuff today. Um, this stuff, um, not that complicated as far as what they're going to be asking you on the AP exam. Um, there are some equations here. What they're typically going to want you to know um, <clears throat> from this particular uh, set of notes is basically just being able to compare gases to one another and know um, if you've got a set of gases and they all have the same average kinetic energy, which one's going to be moving at a faster speed, which one's going to effuse or diffuse faster, that sort of thing. Okay, So this is not, ultimately this stuff is not that difficult. Why is it doing that? Oh my gosh. Okay. I'm going to have to go one at a time here. Um, <coughs> So kinetic molecular, molecular theory, um, it tells why ideal gases behave the way that they do. Um, and when we talk about ideal gases, um, we're making some assumptions about the gases. Okay. So <coughs> these assumptions help us so that we don't have to do calculus when we're talking about gas laws. Um, but these assumptions don't necessarily work. And, and the more real a gas gets, the, the less the assumptions work. And we're going to talk tomorrow about, um, uh, is it tomorrow? I guess it'll be over the weekend. Um, we're going to talk about um, how real gases work and, and that sort of thing and what corrections you have to make if something's behaving a lot more like a real gas. But here's the assumptions that the kinetic uh, molecular theory makes. Number one is that the particles are so small we can assume they have zero volume. Okay, obviously that's not true, um, but if we have to take into account the volume of the particles, the problems become a lot more difficult. So each individual gas particle is small enough that uh, when we're in a, a big, wide open space, really that that is an okay assumption um, compared to the you know the room that I'm standing in right now. Um, individual gas particles have completely insignificant volumes. We can ignore it. Um, particles are in constant motion, and when they collide with things, they cause pressure. Okay, and so I think we talked about this a little bit the other day. But when a gas particle, you have a container. When a gas particle hits the side of that container, it pushes out on it a little bit and uh, causes some pressure. Uh, third, particles don't affect each other, okay? So we just assume these gas particles are moving so fast that um, they really don't, um, they're not attracted to one another, they're not repelled by one another. Essentially, we assume there are no intermolecular forces um, between gas molecules. And again, that's not entirely true. But in a room the size of the one that I'm standing in right now, these particles are spread out enough that they really don't have a lot of attractive or repulsive forces in one another. Um, now again, a lot of these start to um, break down. A lot of these assumptions start to break down. If you squeeze a gas into a very small area, put it under a lot of pressure, because then the particles are close to one another and their volumes do matter and the intermolecular forces matter. Um, <clears throat> We're also assuming the average kinetic energy of the molecules doesn't change when particles collide. That's called an elastic collision. It's assuming that all of the ener energy gets perfectly transferred from one to another. Um, now, we know that's not entirely true either because anytime two things collide, some energy is lost to heat because of friction. Okay. So, again, we're making some assumptions here, and these assumptions don't all completely work, um, but they help us with our math. And then the average kinetic energy is proportional to the Kelvin temperature. Now that one, that one basically does work. Um, <coughs> Kelvin temperature really just is a measure of the average kinetic energy of all the particles in, in a given sample. Okay. <coughs> all right. Um, this is what we just said. I don't know why. I felt the need to repeat this. Absolute temperature of a gas is um, average kinetic energy. Okay, so when we're talking about temperature, you just need to think average kinetic energy. And there's going to be questions on the AP exam where they ask you about two gases that have the same temperature, and they're going to ask you to compare their average kinetic energies, and you're going to say they're the same. 
because the temperatures are the same. And temperature is just a measure of the average kinetic energy. Okay. <laughs> so this is what I just said. Two gases at the same temperature will have the same average kinetic energy. Okay. It doesn't matter what the gases are. Um, if they have the same temperature, they have the same average kinetic energy. Okay, so let's do a little example here. Standard temperature and pressure, we have 0.25 moles of neon gas and 0.50 moles of argon gas. And we want to compare the gas's average mo uh, molecular kinetic energy, average molecular speed, volume, and density. Okay, um, <coughs> now this is kind of, uh, I mean, I guess we can answer this second part of the question now. Uh, we'll be able to answer this a little bit better in a minute. But the average molecular kinetic energy, they're both at standard temperature, okay? Both of these gases are at zero degrees Celsius. So because they have the same temperature, that equals the same average kinetic energy. I don't think that's really an acronym, but I didn't have room to write average kinetic energy, so... Um, <coughs> They're both going to be the same as far as their average kinetic energy. Okay. Now, average molecular speed. Um, I don't remember if we talked about this last year or not, but this is kind of a um, small dog, big dog analogy. That's kind of how I think of it. Um, this may or may not work for you. If you have a small dog, like a, a really small dog, then you know in your living room that small dog, you know, it's just constantly darting all over the place, okay? Um, a big dog can't do that because even if the big dog has the same amount of energy, it takes way more energy to get the mass of the big dog moving than it does to get the mass of the small dog moving. Okay, so you've got the small dog darting around the room like crazy. The big dog can't dart around the room like that. It can't, you know, go from zero to 60 in half a second. Um, so the smaller the gas particle, given the same amount of energy, which we just said they have the same amount of kinetic energy, okay? The one that's going to have the higher speed, given the same amount of energy, is going to be the smaller one, okay? And so neon, if you look on the periodic table, neon is smaller than argon. And so uh, neon is going to have a, um, let's see, neon is going to have a greater speed than the argon. I think I wrote my thing the right way there as far as speed okay <clears throat> as far as the volume of the two we've got 0.25 moles of neon gas and 0.50 moles of argon gas um, so far the number of moles hasn't really uh, affected anything okay because again and, and maybe I should come back to this the kinetic energy here we're talking about is average kinetic energy so the amount of the gas present doesn't really matter we're just taking the average kinetic energy of all the particles, okay? And since there's the same same temperature, even though there are different amounts, it's going to be the same average kinetic energy. Um, and then the same average molecular speed, same thing here. Um, the amount doesn't really affect that very much, okay? Now, when we get down to volume and density, uh, volume <coughs> of the gas is going to be affected by the amount of moles that we have, okay? And and you remember, hopefully, from the other day, the more moles of gas you have, the uh, the higher its volume. Okay, that's Avogadro's relationship. So, because we have 0.50 moles of the argon gas, that means that the volume of the argon is going to be greater than the volume of the neon. Okay. Now again. We're not thinking about the size of the particles on this part, okay? Because remember, the, the assumption um, in the uh, kinetic theory is that these gas particles themselves have zero volume. So we're not thinking about the volume of the gas particles themselves. We're thinking about the amount of space they take up as they spread out to fill their container, okay? Um, they're at the same temperature, they're at the same pressure, so if we're thinking about PV equals NRT here, then really the only things we have to think about are the relationship between the volume and the number of moles. And for that reason, because there's more moles of argon gas, uh, there's going to be a higher volume of argon gas. Okay. Um, and then density, 
Density has to do with, it's related to molar mass. Okay, so now we're thinking about the actual molar mass of the, uh, the gas particles here. And again, because argon is, has a higher molar mass than neon, it's going to have a higher density. So argon is greater than neon. And again, if you're unsure about that one, you could think about the um, Mr. Or Dr. T. Poops <coughs> equation that we have. Okay, That relates molar mass and density. Molar mass and density are directly related to one another because they're on opposite sides of the equation. Um, and they're both in the numerator of that equation. Okay, And so what that means is, as you know, all other things held equal, temperature and pressure equal, then uh, as the density increases, the molar mass increases, and as the molar mass increases, so does the density. Okay? So those are the relationships between those things. <laughs> Alright, another example here, at negative 10 and 1.1 atmospheres of pressure, average kinetic kinetic energy of one mole of H2 gas is 5.1 times 10 to the negative 20th joules. What's the average kinetic energy of 0.5 moles of O2 gas at the same temperature and pressure? Okay. Once again, they're going to throw, they do this in the AP exam, they're going to throw all this information at you and, you know, they're going to ask you for this complicated solution to a problem and all you have to do is recognize these things are at the same temperature, okay? They're asking you about average kinetic energy. Average kinetic energy is temperature. Okay? So if they have the same temperature, they have the same average kinetic energy. It doesn't matter how much of it you have. You have one mole of H2 gas here, and you have half of that in O2 gas. You got 0.5 moles instead of one. That doesn't matter because we're talking about an average here. Okay? So all you have to do here is say, the average kinetic energy of the O2 gas is going to be exactly the same. It's 5.1 times 10 to the negative 20th joules. Okay. Alright, another example. We're doing lots of examples here. Give an example of a gas that would have an average atomic or molecular speed similar to that of helium at 0 degrees Celsius in one atmosphere of pressure. Okay. Um, so... Again, if we're thinking about the big dog, small dog thing, um, given the same temperature and the same pressure, so again, the key here, zero degrees Celsius, they're both at zero degrees. They have the same temperature, so they both have the same average kinetic energy. And actually, it might be helpful to think about the uh, the equation for kinetic energy, which I haven't mentioned up to this point. Uh, we have mentioned this in the past. It's one half mv squared, right? So if you think about that equation, you can see if this is the same for both of them, okay? Um, then, if the mass increases, uh, the velocity would have to decrease, okay? You can, you can see that here. If the mass goes up, the velocity has to go down in order to keep the kinetic energy the same, and vice versa. Okay, So that, that also helps to support our argument here that the um, big dog, small dog thing. The, the bigger the gas molecule, the slower it moves when given the same kinetic energy as a smaller gas particle. Okay, So what we're looking for, to find one that has a similar speed, similar velocity, is one that has a similar mass. Okay. And so probably the closest gas to helium, as far as mass is concerned, would be hydrogen. Okay, Because you have to go all the way to nitrogen to find another gas um, on the periodic table. And nitrogen is, is a little bit further away. So we're probably going to pick hydrogen here. Okay, It's probably the best choice on this particular one. And the hydrogen is going to be a little bit faster than the helium, but it's going to be similar as far as it's speed. <clears throat> okay, kinetic energy equations. Um, here's the thing. Let me go back to this. I said this before. Um, the equations in this particular section, you don't get the equation sheet on the multiple choice portion. And they don't necessarily, in all the multiple choice questions I've seen on the AP exam, they don't necessarily expect you to remember these equations. What you have to remember is the relationships. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on derivations here. Um, I, I will you know, show you the two equations that they use to derive the, um, the root mean speed equation. 
Um, but we're not going to talk in detail about how it gets derived because it's just it's not that important to you as long as you understand the relationships. Okay, so we just talked about the kinetic energy equation, one half mv squared. There's another kinetic energy equation uh, for average kinetic energy that relates the um, <coughs> to the R and the temperature. Okay, so you can see kinetic energy is not exactly the same as temperature, but it's proportional to the temperature. You have to multiply the temperature by this three halves R in order to uh, to make the two equal to one another. Okay, so when I say that average kinetic energy is the same as temperature, I mean they're proportional. So that when I say that one increases, so does the other. Okay, um, And if the temperature stays the same, then so would the average kinetic energy. Um, so those are two equations. And basically, those two equations are used to derive this equation right here. What's happening? OK. So kind of a weird little shadow there. Um, but this is the equation. And again, m is the molar mass, and that's going to be in kilograms per mole. And r is the 8.314 joules per Kelvin times mole that you've got on your equation sheet. Um, that might be a good number to remember, the 8.314. Um, that comes up in a couple other places. So you've got the 0 0.08206R, and then you've got the 8.314R. And those are probably your two most common Rs. Um, but this URMS over here, this stands for root mean speed. Okay, And, and all that is is basically it's telling us a, a comparison in velocity. So you can see again, the molar mass is on the bottom. Okay, It's in kilograms per mole. Um, but you really don't have to, I've never seen a situation where you have to plug into this equation. You just need to be aware of the relationships. Okay, And, and really, this is just sort of a rearranging of the, um, of the two kinetic energy equations that you saw before. Um, let's see, what else do I want to say about this? I mean, just, just notice the relationship here. The m molar mass is on the bottom. What that means is, as the molar mass increases, it's inversely related to the velocity, or the root mean speed. Okay, And so as the mass of the gas particle increases, the speed goes down. Okay, And you just have to understand that. Velocity is going to be in meters per second. Um, let's do an example here. Can't calculate the root mean square velocity of carbon dioxide at 25 degrees Celsius. I'm going to do one of these just to kind of show you how you would plug into the equation. But again, I've never seen uh, never seen you need to do this on the AP exam. What I've seen is you have to compare a couple of different gases and decide which one is going to have the highest uh, root mean speed. Okay. So carbon dioxide at 25 degrees Celsius. So coming back to our equation here. Um, square root of 3RT over M. That was neat. Okay, so there's our equation. And I mean, all you're doing is just plugging into this to find the velocity. So we've got the square root of 3 times our R, which is the 8.314. Uh, times our T, which you know has to be in Kelvin, obviously. That's 298. <coughs> and then we divide that by the molar mass. Now, you have to be careful with the molar mass here because it has to be in kilograms per mole in order to get these units to work out because the 8.314 has the unit joules in it, and joules is related to kilograms. So um, carbon dioxide, uh, I believe, is 44 grams per mole. So that's actually 0 0.044 kilograms per mole. OK. And when we work that out, pretty big number. Um, this is going to be 1. Point, let's see, we've got two sig figs here. So 1.7 times 10 to the fifth meters per second. But that kind of makes sense. You would expect a gas particle to be traveling fairly quickly. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, that's pretty fast. Oh, <laughs> okay. That's why it's pretty fast. I was looking at that, I was like, whoa, that's getting kind of close to the speed of light there. Uh, I forgot to take the square root of that number. So that's going to make it quite a bit bigger than it should have been. Okay, so we square root that. I mean, it's still a big speed, but not, not that big. It's a little bit much. So we end up with 411, or I guess if we're running two sig figs, 410 meters per second. Okay. That's more reasonable. Um, <clears throat> so that's how you calculate the root mean square velocity. Okay, and then there's two other ones on here, um, hydrogen and uh, chlorine. Now the only thing that would change there is the um, is the molar mass number that you plug in, and really. Like I said, the only thing you're really going to have to do with that is you might be asked to compare those three. Which one has the highest root mean speed at 25 degrees Celsius? Okay, now this other one is at 250 degrees, so they switched it up. But if they were all three at 25, then um, your question might be which one would have the highest velocity, and you just have to look at the molar mass. Okay, so you should be able to do that, even without the equation. Um, Range of velocities, I don't know that you need to know this a whole lot other than um, air is crowded most of the time. So usually a, a molecule can't travel very far before hitting another particle, okay? Um, is this on your, on your notes? Yeah, it is, okay. Um, <clears throat> So it's about 10 to the negative 7th, and that's that's going to be in meters. Um, so it's a very small distance this thing can travel before it hits another particle. That's fairly obvious. Um, and then temperature, you need to understand that's an average, um, because at any given time, there's going to be molecules that, that hit other molecules and almost come to a standstill before they are hit by another molecule and start moving again. Okay, So this is, this is an average of all the particles. Um, and this is shown on a graph called a velocity distribution. This did not copy well on your notes. Um, and it's not great on here. So um, you don't need to see the equation anyway. Um, that equation is really not necessary for you. But I do want you to look at the graph here. So if, if you can see the graph, um, we've got the number of particles versus molecular velocity here. Okay, And if you look at at 273 Kelvin, um, the majority of the particles at 273, and I'm, I'm making a circle there, you can't see it because it's black. Let me try a different color. Hmm. There we go. Okay. So up there, the majority of the particles, the highest number of particles, has a you know, a decently low velocity here. I mean, it's not incredibly high. Now, at any given time, you're going to have some particles that are way over here that are moving incredibly fast, um, but that's not the majority of them. And you'll even have some over here that are moving really, really, really fast. Um, but the majority of the particles in that distribution are going to be moving at a fairly slow velocity somewhere around here. Okay. And then you'll also have some, like I said, that you know they've just hit another particle at that given moment, and they're almost at a standstill. They're almost not moving at all. Okay. Um, if we increase the temperature to 1,273 Kelvin, uh, what we actually do is we sort of spread out the distribution a little bit more. So the higher the temperature, um, the wider the range of the velocities of the particles. Okay. So you still have uh, I'm trying to circle this with black. You still have the majority of these particles um, that are moving at a certain velocity. But as you notice, on either side of that peak, there's actually a lot of particles moving at this velocity and at this velocity. Okay, um, so it's a little bit more spread out as you uh, as you increase the temperature. Um, you get more of a wide range of particles moving in different at different speeds. Okay, so that's a velocity distribution graph, um, and that's I think pretty much all you need to know about that. Um, <coughs> the average velocity increases as temperature increases, and we just talked about this. The spread increases as well as temperature increases. 
Okay, and that's that's basically what I want you to get from that graph. Okay, let's talk about if effusion and diffusion. Okay, effusion is the passage of a gas through a small hole into a vacuum. Okay, um, when we talk effusion, um, now this isn't passing through into a vacuum. So that's the technical definition, but it might help you to think about maybe a balloon. Okay. Um, Gases will still effuse um, into air that is not a vacuum or into an area that's not a vacuum. It just takes longer. Um, so when you think effusion, maybe think like a balloon, okay? Because there are tiny, small openings in balloons, and these gases can actually get out through those holes. Um, and over time, your balloon deflates. Okay, you guys know that to be true. Um, now they're making balloons now that have very, 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 very small holes. So it takes a really long time for the balloon to deflate. Um, but the old balloons, you know, those would be deflated in a few days because the holes are fairly big, and so those gas particles are able to escape out of them. Okay, so that's a fusion. Um, the fusion rate is going to measure how fast this happens. Now, there, again, there's an equation for this, but here's what you really need to remember. Um, if you have a small gas particle, we already established that a small gas particle is moving faster. And we also established that, um, sorry, I'm having trouble focusing at the moment. Um, OK, so we established that small gas particles are moving faster. Right, And then if you also think about it, small gas particles are going to be able to get through a small opening easier than bigger gas particles. So for those two reasons, small gases, and this is really what you need to remember here, small gases effuse faster than large gases. Okay, and If you remember that, for the AP exam, you'll probably be okay. Um, Graham's law um, says that the rate of effusion is inversely proportional to the square root of the mass of its particles. Okay, that's basically what I just said. Um, and so here's the equation for that, okay? Um, the rate of effusion for gas 1 over the rate of effusion for gas 2 is equal to the square of the molar mass of 2 over the square of the molar mass of 1, okay? And so, <coughs> oops, same thing again, sorry. So there's your um, there's your equation for that, okay? But again, as long as you remember what I just told you, I don't think you need to know the equation. And here's how this is derived. Um, so you've got your effusion rate one and if your effusion rate two, okay? Um, and it should be proportional to the root mean speed, okay? So we just plug in the the root mean speed equation here, in case you're interested in this derivation. Um, because that is essentially the rate at which these things effuse. They're going to effuse faster if they, you know, if they're moving faster. It kind of makes sense. So notice here, this and this just cancel out, so then we end up with the um, m2 over m1, because these are both in the denominators of the fractions, and so those have to be flipped. Okay? So that's that. <laughs> All right, examples here. Helium effuses through a porous cylinder 3.20 times faster than another gas. What is the unknown gas's molar mass? Okay, if you ever had one where you would have to calculate the um, the molar mass, then you would actually have to use the equation. Okay, so we've got essentially what we've got here is rate one over rate two, um, and I know that's not the right abbreviations for that. I'm just being a little sloppy here. Uh, and the molar mass, square root of the molar mass of 2 over the square root of the molar mass of 1. Okay, so you have to you have to have them diagonal to one another. If you have rate 1 on top of rate 2, then you have to have molar mass 2 on top of molar mass 1. Okay? So, um, we know, uh, let's say that helium is our gas 1, okay? And it's 3.20 times faster than another gas, all right? So, whatever that other gas is, um, it's 3.20 times faster. Okay, so its rate is 3.20 times bigger. Um, we don't know the molar mass of the second gas. 
we do know the, the molar mass of helium is um, about four. Okay, I'm going to be a little sloppy here. <laughs> and so we can actually solve this thing for the molar mass of the second gas. The square root of M2 is going to be um, 2 times 3 point I should be able to do that in my head, 6.4. Okay, so we square both of these. And the molar mass of our gas should be about uh, about 41 or so. Uh, and this is going to be grams per mole. Now, you have to be a little bit careful. Um, technically, on the other equations, the molar mass is in kilograms per mole. Since this is a proportion like this, it doesn't really matter. It should work work out either way, I think. Um, I could try it the other way using kilograms just to make sure. But again, ultimately, that doesn't matter that much because they're not going to give you a problem like this. What they're going to ask you is which gas it fuses faster. Okay, and as long as you know that, as long as you know the bigger gas takes longer to effuse and the smaller gas effuses faster, then you should be fine. <clears throat> okay, um, and this is another one asking, you know, if you have a certain amount of NH3 effusing, how much HCl would effuse in the same amount of time. Um, and again, these are not the kinds of problems that you're going to have, okay? Um, but this one, it's uh, this is a rate, okay? So you've got 0 0.00251 moles per 2.47 minutes, okay? So you've got moles per minute. That would be your rate. So you've got your rate one, your rate two, and then you know the molar masses of both of these because you know what they are. So you could plug that in and find the rate of the other, um, find the rate of the HCl, and then you would be able to solve this problem. But again, not the kind of thing they're going to give you. Sample of N2 effuses through a hole in 38 seconds. What must be the molecular weight of gas that effuses in 55 seconds under identical? OK, so again, this is just playing with the you know Graham's Law equation. Um, and I think you guys could probably figure that out if you had one of those thrown at you. But again, I don't expect that to happen. If we have equal moles of three gases in a porous container, which of the three will have the highest partial pressure in the container after some of the gases are fused? Now, this is more like the kind of question that I would expect you to see, OK? And then which of the three will have the lowest partial pressure? So in other words, what they're asking is, um, after a certain amount of time, all of these gases are going to effuse a little bit out of their container, OK? They're going to leave. So what this is essentially asking is, which one's going to leave the fastest? Because whichever one effuses the fastest, there's less of that gas left, so that's going to be the lowest partial pressure, okay? Um, because that's the gas that has gone away. All right, so. Um, the one that's going to fuse the fastest here is the smallest, which obviously is going to be helium. Okay, so helium would have the lowest partial pressure, and then the one that would have the highest partial partial pressure. I'm kind of answering this backwards here, is going to be the one that's the biggest. Okay, neon is has a molar mass of 20, uh, N2 has a molar mass of 28. So that's going to be our highest. Um, so the highest partial pressure is the N2, and it's just based on their size. Now, that's the kind of question that I would expect you to see on the AP exam, OK? All right, diffusion, really same thing, OK, as far as um, the speed of the molecule is really the thing that influences the most, OK? Uh, diffusion is the spreading of the gas through a room. And this happens slowly, considering how fast these molecules move, OK? Um, I think the one that we calculated the speed of earlier was 400 meters per second. So if it's moving at 400 meters per second, it should be able to cover the length of this room very, very quickly. But if you spray cologne in one corner of a room and you wait to see how long it takes you to smell it, you're going to notice it takes a little while. Okay, And the reason for that is 
these molecules are not, it's not like a straight shot, okay? This is like walking through the freshman hallway. Um, you're bouncing off of everybody and everything, and it takes forever to get through this hallway that it should be very quick to get through, okay? That's what these gases are having to do. And so these gases are bouncing off of each other. You know, they just move for a tiny little bit before they hit another gas particle. And so it just takes a while for them to work through one another to get where they need to go. And that's why diffusion doesn't happen faster. Um, but the best estimate is still Graham's law on these, even though, you know, they're bouncing all over the place. On average, the faster the particles are moving, the faster they're going to diffuse. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and I think that's it on your notes. I believe. Yep. So that's it for today. Um, we will talk about real gases tomorrow and how those relate to ideal gases and when the ideal gas thing kind of breaks down. And then we'll be done with this unit. Be in class. class.